Hi, this is Michael Buffer, and welcome to the Box Hard Podcast. Hello, everyone. This is Mikey Garcia. It's the monster from the swamps, Regis Rougarou Program. Hey, what's up? This is King Carlos Molina, former IBF world champ. This is Michael, the bounty hunter, 2012 Olympian and your people's champ. This is Charlie Edwards, flyweight champion of the world. This is Fast Eddie Chambers, and you're listening to the Box Hard Podcast with my main man, Joey Cosmo. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 350 of the Box Hard Podcast. I'm your host, Joey Coastman. I'm joined as ever by former heavyweight world title challenger, Mr. Fast Eddie Chambers. Eddie, how are you doing this week, man? I'm good, my man. How about you? Always doing well when speaking with you, Eddie. Uh, this week's show is going out on a Wednesday, which is um, which is something we don't normally do. It normally goes out on Thursday, so it's a day early this week. Uh, the reason for that is because on Thursday um, I'll be attending my brother's funeral. So um, yeah, just wanted to throw that in there and dedicate this week's episode to him. Gone far too soon. Um, oh, let's starting things on a bit of a sad note, but let's move. Let's let's keep it positive. Um, Thursday, so tomorrow night. Uh, Montreal, oh sorry, last Thursday, this is the review part of the show, um, so last Thursday, June 23rd, Montreal Casino, Quebec, Canada, um, over here, Eric Bazignan, he is now 28-0, and a unanimous decision over 10, quite wide in the end against Marcelo Esteban Caceres, who's now 30-4 and with a draw, um, it was for the vacant NABA super middleweight and the NABF super middleweight uh, titles, um, I thought that Maybe Caceres might be able to cause some issues because we've seen him cause issues to uh, Billy Joe Saunders. We've seen him drop er um, Edgar Belanga. But no, according to the scorecards, it was quite wide and quite dominant from Eric Bazignan. Certainly one to watch. I don't know how he's managed to maneuver himself to 28-0, and though, without me really hearing much about the guy. Um, but good stuff for him. I didn't actually see it. Um, elsewhere on the undercard, Eves Ulysse Jr. with a win now, 21-2. and two, A KO in round three against Rekroon Connor Facunda Arce. I think a last-minute uh, replacement or addition to the bill. Now 14-7 and seven with two draws. Artem Oganesian as well. He was an undefeated prospect, 13-0. and 0, Now 13-1. and 1. He lost his O to, um, I guess, a little bit of a veteran, Dante Jardin, who's now 35-8. and eight. Some people were describing him as a journeyman. I think that's very unfair, but he won unanimously over 10. Oganesian was actually down in the first round and went on to pretty much lose, um, you know, almost every single round after that. Moving out now to Mexico, one fight to mention over here at the Palenque Fex in Mexicali, Baja California. Hecky Budler with a win now, 34-4. and four. A Unanimous decision there over 12 against Elwin Soto. Soto down in round 12, and that... Um, that 10-8 round actually swung the contest to Budler because he was actually down on the cards. He needed that knockdown there. And in the end, all three judges had it exactly the same. Just one point for Budler. So 114-113. Moving out now to the Sky Dome in Coventry, West Midlands, United Kingdom. It was great to see this one on Sky TV. Let's start with the undercard. Dylan Chima just about scraped a victory against journeyman Stu Greener, who's now 4-9, and nine, but Dylan Chima's 6-0. and oh. um, Karis arting stall she made her professional debut it was a successful one and it was as expected a points win over six against the teak tough vader masio kate who to be honest at times was really really struggling and i thought that the knockout would actually come um but i won some money on that one because i expected her to not get her out of there so masio kate once again doesn't get knocked out she's a very 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 tough lady um Elsewhere on the card, Casey Benjamin with a win now, 16-1 and one with a draw. He was able to beat over six, Serge and Bomo. Uh, pr pretty straightforward, that one. Uh, elsewhere on the card, a knockout win in round seven against David Benitez, who is now 8-7 and seven for Mr. Aaron McKenna, now 15-0, and 0, the Irish prospect. Also on the card, Corey Gibbs with a win now, 17-0, and 0, a points win over eight against Carlos Perez, who's now 17-7 and 7 with two draws. Adam Azim with a great win, um, probably 
performance of the night, I guess, when you look at everything back now. Um, certainly very impressive and by far the most impressive and explosive performance of the night. Now 5-0, and a TKO in round one against Anthony Loffitt, who's now 8-2. and um, Loffitt was down once prior to his corner throwing in the towel. It was for the vacant WBC youth Intercontinental Super Lightweight title. Elsewhere on the card, the rematch between River Wilson, Bent, and Tyler Denny. Tyler Denny was able to win this time. I think the first contest was a draw. Tyler Denny this time, though, with a split decision win over 10 there for the vacant English middleweight title. Uh, Wilson Bent was cut over both eyes and had a point deducted in round 7 for holding. And the main event, Sam Eggington, now 32-7, and seven, a unanimous decision win over 12 against Prism Slaw Zisk, who... Um, loses his O here. He's now 18 and 1. It was for the vacant IBO World Super Welterweight title. Um, again, typical, typical Sam Eggington kind of fight. All action from Eggington. Um, you know, early on, Eggington hurt um, Zisk really badly. I'd say during even the first round, he put a real dent in Zisk, and certainly he started to build on that from round two and three, and he was just, you know, really hurting the guy, and it looked like the end was really near, and, you know, he was nailed on to get a knockout win, I felt. Well, that's what everyone else thought. I'm going to get on to the reason I'm not including myself in that. And I was thinking, wow, this guy is, is really, really, really tough. I mean, he's taking these shots. He's he's taking big, big, big shots. He can't keep taking these all night. And he obviously was very tough, really, really had a good chin. But I thought if he was able to weather the storm then perhaps Eggington might gas out, and perhaps the guy might have a chance himself. Um, so at this point, I saw the odds on Sam Eggington to win on points, and they were 16 to 1. So I, I stuck a small little stake on that, and of course that ended up coming in. Um, and yeah, it was just because I, I, I kind of noticed the body language change from Eggington before anyone else seemed to do, including the commentators. I guess that's what happens when you watch a guy so many times, you start to um, almost like unconsciously pick up certain things in their in their typical uh, boxing style. You notice little differences, and you, you see things that perhaps others don't see. And yeah, like I say, the guy did weather the storm, and he did actually start to come on strong in the mid-rounds, and um, Eggington seemed to have, you know, slowed down, tired a little bit, because he did. He did use up most of his tank pretty early. Um, and yeah, in the end, I think Eggington did finish quite strong, but yeah, clear winner on points, and... Um, I wouldn't mind seeing that guy again against maybe a kind of lower level UK fighter. But as for Eggington, a good win once again. Um, he, he always earns his money and he's always in a good fight. Um, anyway, that's it for the UK. We're going to move now out to uh, the US and we're going to go here to the final card to mention. It took place at the Tech Port Arena in San Antonio, Texas, USA. I'm going to fly through the card myself. And then I'm going to come to you, Eddie. So let's 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 fly for it here. The undercard, um, Nikita Ababi with a win. I didn't actually see this one. I don't think they showed it. He's now 12 and 0. A unanimous decision over eight against Noe Larios Jr., who's now 14 and 2. Raymond Ford now 12 and 0 with a draw. A unanimous decision there over 10 against Richard Medina, who now has lost his O. He's now 13 and 1. It was for the vacant IBF North American and WBA Continental Americas featherweight titles um elsewhere on the card jessica mccaskill now 12 and 2 her opponent alma ibarra retired on her stall after round three it was more like the corner pulling her out actually um that one was for mccaskill's belts she's got every single one including the ibo as well so alma ibarra now 10 and 2 it was a bit of a weird stoppage like i say um I'm not sure there was a little bit of a kind of miscommunication between her and her corner. She didn't want it stopped. I didn't think she wanted it stopped. And some others were saying she'd said something in Spanish, which which translated to her wanting it to be stopped. It was really confusing. Um, and later on in the night, they were talking about her. They kept referring to her as quitting, quitting, quitting. I felt that was a bit harsh, but again, I don't speak uh, Spanish too fantastically to know what was actually said. Um, elsewhere on the card, let's talk about this one here. Murajon Akhmadaliev still undefeated, still 
uh, holding two of the four belts at Super Bantamweight. He's now 11-0, and a TKO in the 12th and final round against Ronnie Rios, who's now 33-4. and I did say I thought that Akhmadaliev would win on points or stop Rios late. Couldn't have stopped him much later than that. He was down um, and, and stopped in that 12th and final round. Um, still kind of look at Akhmadaliev and feel like he is beatable. And still, I look at him and think that Stephen Fulton is the man to do it. So I wasn't overly impressed with Akhmadaliev. And I liked the way that Rios was boxing for the majority of the fight. And then the main event. Um, Jesse Bam... Rodriguez now 16-0, and a successful defense of his WBC Super Flyweight World title with Saxel Wangek, a.k.a. Uh, Sarisaket Sorung Versailles down in round 7 and TKO'd in round 8. Um, I'm going to run through these rounds real quick here. I felt the first round was a great start for Bam Rodriguez. You could tell he was super confident. He kept that tight guard and he picked his shots well and landed some beautiful combinations. Um... I know that he trains with with Robert Garcia, and I can see a lot of similarities in his style to Mikey Garcia's style, actually, by the way. And you can give your words on that in a minute, Eddie, if you can see something uh, similar in there. Um, but yeah, Rung Versai seemed very heavy-footed early on, a bit too stationary. Round two, Rung Versai, I felt was starting to kind of... I guess get a bit closer, but it wasn't it wasn't really working too much. He you know he needed to eat three or four shots just to land one hard one of his own, and he pretty much had no other choice. Like I say, being heavy legged and you know slow footwork and just the uh, you know the, the smoothness of Bam Rodriguez's boxing had him in this position, and there was not much he could do about it. Um, Rodriguez as well landed some great jabs in that second round. I gave him the first two rounds. In fact, I gave him every round. Um, round three, again, almost perfect, the boxing from Bam Rodriguez. He was displaying an excellent defense. He was using good head movement. He was frustrating the older man. Rung Versai was loading up on every shot, but wasn't really having much success. And Bam, again, was just using his far superior footwork. He was finding angles to surprise Rung Versai. Um, round four... Again, it was it was almost like a Lomachenko performance at times because he really does have the full package, uh, Rodriguez. Um, I gave round five to him as well. Round six, another round for Rodriguez. Again, the speed was insane. That's both uh, feet and hands. And he fights as good, by the way, going backwards as he does forwards, I felt. And in, in fact, at times, he even looked better on the back foot um, going backwards. Um, his punch selection, the the... I guess the torque or the torque eh, he gets on, on the punches is crazy. He really turns them over perfectly. The waist turns behind the punches. He does everything absolutely correct. Round seven, of course, as I said, down goes Rung Versailles. Left hook uh, made him lose his footing. It was ruled a slip. Um, I think it was ruled a slip. I'm not too sure, actually. Um, I'm not entirely sure. It didn't really matter in the end. But yeah, Rodriguez absolutely beat the hell out of Rung Versailles in that round. He was starting to really up the gears. Um, he, he couldn't really miss, actually. Any any punch he threw was landing. And it was like it was almost like he was in a different time zone to Rung Versailles. Rung Versailles was about three hours behind. Um, and then round eight, like I say, he just finished him off. He obliterated him. And he gave him such a horrendous beatdown that it... It almost could be career-ending for Rung Vassar. We know he's very tough, um, but he's had a long career. He took an absolute beating in those final two rounds. He didn't win a round in this contest. And I've got to say it, man, it's early. It's still very early. We're still in the first half of the year. But, you know, Rodriguez is possibly going to be fighter of the year by the end of 2022, you know, for beating Quadras and now Rung Versai after moving up two weight classes, by the way, to be in this division. Hmm. And um, and he, he moved up, you know, on short notice the first time and he's hung around and he's he's doing this to, to the so-called best guys in this division, Eddie. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And he, he, he really surprised me. Honestly, I didn't even, I mean, I heard of the kid before, but I really never got a really good, uh, good chance to see him fight. I haven't watched a lot of the lighter, super lighter weight guys, you know what I mean, down to band I'm waiting below much. So I didn't really know much about him. But what I saw, and I was, you know, I was actually having a conversation with, with Ant over the text, and we were just going over how, like, how, how superior his footwork was to the other guy. But not only that, just when you mentioned Lomachenko, mentioned Lomachenko like I was like, man, he's really doing a lot of what he does, really hitting those angles really well. 
and not only just, you know, hitting the angles and making a miss, but he was landing big shots. He did one of my favorite moves that I've been working on recently, and that's like cutting the angle to to the side and like throwing your left hook. It's hard for me to explain just, you know, it's hard, but I can visualize it, I'm pretty sure. Some people may understand what I'm saying, but he was just, he, he was doing a lot of really, really good things. I mean, he's extremely talented, but he's also technically sound in a lot of ways too. So it's not just talent and he's doing certain things wrong. He's talented and he's doing most of, most of what he, uh, most of what he does is, is right. It's correct. It's the correct form. It's the correct, it's, it's, it's the, the punch count is the, not the punch count. The punch selection is the, is, is the right punches. It's just, it's hard. To, it's hard to find a flaw with the kid right now. Uh, obviously, I feel like this guy might have been the, you know, one of the best guys. He might have been very dangerous, but his style, it just, uh, it just made Bam Rodriguez look even better. I mean, I feel like the kid would have been great regardless, but it, the, the other guy, Sal Rungo, his, 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 his style just doesn't work for a guy that's this crafty and this is this technically sound and this fast. It's just, it's like he's fighting an uphill battle. The only thing that he could have done, which is what he was trying to do, and I was landing a big shot maybe change the course of the fight, but um, Ben Rodriguez stayed really, really close to the game plan, used his ability, angles, everything to just dominate the fight, just a, a dominant performance. It was just, it was an amazing thing to see, but once again, I'm, I'm going to give him 100% of the credit, but I'm also going to look at uh, as his, his opponent is just not, it's not a good matchup for him. It's a horrible matchup for him. His style and the way he fights, it just it just doesn't work for a kid like Bam Rodriguez. So, you know, a big props to him. And I'm glad to see what he's done and hopefully continues to get better from here. Looking forward to it. And just before we wrap up part one, Eddie, I do want to just ask what you felt about my comparison with him and Mikey Garcia, just because obviously they're both, you know, that they were both trained under uh, Robert. And I can just see some kind of similarity with obviously the way that uh, Mikey had really good defense. He'd keep that tight guard and he'd also have every single punch in the book. Um, you know, he threw every kind of punch in the book. Knew, you know, he knew when to throw the right shots and he had that wide punch selection. Can you see something similar there? Well, not, without a doubt, the, of the things you just explained, especially with the tight guard and understanding when to throw punches, understanding range, how at, at what punches to throw at, at what times. Yeah, there's 100 percent. You can see a lot of it. You can see it rubs off. You know what I mean? The, uh, the, the style in that, in, in that way, the style of training for Robert Garcia, what's important to him. And don't get me wrong. The kid already has natural ability and probably, you know, a pretty good fighter, even, you know, even before, but with this, you can clearly see a lot of the comparison. You know, a lot of them. I think he, honestly, and this is no knock to Mikey or anything, I just think he's a little bit more talented in, in certain aspects. I think Mikey was, like, basic, but very, very good as a basic guy. Like, when I say basic, I mean, you know, to the, to the like, like, for example, you look at Triple G. Not really a whole lot of special effects. He doesn't do a lot of amazing looking things beside punch your head off. And I think that's kind of where Mikey is. With Bam Rodriguez, I see a lot more sauce, a lot more, you know, flair to his game. And, uh, but uh, both talented guys, and, and, and this kid has a real future in the game, for sure. Yeah, without a doubt. And just before we wrap up part one, the final thing for me to do is to welcome this week's special guest. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the reigning and undefeated WBC featherweight champion of the world, Mr. Mark Magsayo. Mark, welcome to the show, my friend. Hello, Joey. Hello to everyone. Thank you for having me. Hey, it's my pleasure. So, Mark, it's the first time we've spoken. Uh, myself and a lot of other boxing fans from the UK are becoming extremely excited when we watch your fights now. Um, let's just go back in time slightly to that crazy fight against Julio Seja. Um, obviously, yeah. he was down, you were down, then he was down and out. One of the best knockouts of 2021. Um, just tell us about that crazy fight looking back now. <laughs> That fight, that fight with Julio Serra, it's a tough fight for me. One of my tough fight, uh, one of my tough fight because he's a he's a strong fighter, aggressive fighter, an experienced fighter. So and it's big, big opportunity to me to to uh, it's a pleasure to me to fight with him, like a a, a, a Mexican warrior. 
yeah, he really is a Mexican warrior. And would you say, Mark, that... Uh, would you say that you thrive under pressure because your last two fights have been your biggest two fights of your career and you've probably yeah. performed your best both times yes uh it's a little bit pressure because uh because um I, that 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 fight is a is a key for me to fight a world title fight and to fight Gary russell and then that's it's my dream to fight a world title fight and i won a world title fight and of course, you've been training with Freddie Roach since 2020. Um, how did that come about for you, Mark? Um, I trained with, with Coach Freddie since July 1st, 2020. And he, I thought I already know my boxing. I thought I already know boxing. But when I come in and train in the gym, they correct my mistakes. Yeah, my, my punches are accurate now. And I'm a better fighter now. And almost every Filipino looks up to Manny Pacquiao. He's a national hero. What was it like to be able to train alongside him for the last parts of his career? It's an honor for me to train with uh, Senator Manny Pacquiao in the gym. We trained together in, in the when in his last fight with Ugas. So it's a, it's my dream to to train with uh, Senator Manny Pacquiao and. It's my dream uh, to train with the Coach Freddie Roach, and it's a dream dream come true for me to become a world champion. <laughs> and did yeah. you did you already know Manny before you joined the gym or not? I already know him in in, in the Philippines. Um, we talk each other in the Philippines, and we signed contract there. Okay, okay. And let's just talk about briefly your last fight. Obviously, I'm sure you're never going to forget the date, January yes. 22nd, 2022. You upset the odds. You dethroned a long reigning champion, Gary Russell Jr. Yeah. The fight ends, majority decision after 12 rounds. Did you always feel that you would get the decision or were you worried when they were totaling the scorecards up at the end? I'm not. I'm not worried in the in the the whole of fight every round. Many pro debut. Um. Uh. And and that fight, I think I I win every round. That in that fight, clearly, clearly, clearly won that fight. Yeah, and I'm a I'm a big fan of the Gary Russell brothers. I've I've had them on the show before, but I also think you won that fight very clearly um tell it's me early. tell me mark I, I know the answer to this question already but what did it mean to you a guy from the philippines to win a world title from a fighter as good as gary russell i feel like I, i'm 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 his level i'm his level an elite fighter and good fighter because he thinks that i'm too slow for him he underestimated my skills so he's surprised when I when I when I when he feels his my when he feels my power and he and he feels that in round first round second round third round so he changed his tactics he runs if he if he did not run that fight maybe there's a knock, there's going to be a knockdown that night okay and i want to ask as well was it the happiest moment of your life when you heard and the new yes sir I, that's like my dream come true and i'm crying because I, that's built, that that belt every fighter wants that WBC a world championship belt. That belt is a pretty prestigious belt. So it's my dream to become a world champion, and it's WBC. Beautiful man. And let's get on to the main reason you're here. Your next fight, your first title defense. It all goes down next weekend in San Antonio, Texas. You'll be mm -hmm. boxing former WBC Super Bantamweight World Champion, the undefeated Ray Vargas. Firstly, what is your opinion on Vargas and his style of fighting, Mark? Um, for me, my my opinion for his style is a uh, he's a tall fighter, a uh, slugger fighter. Yeah. I never seen him fight in forward. He always backwards and run. So I hope this coming next Saturday, he's not going to run too much so we can fight and brawl together. And how do you see the fight playing out? Because we're starting to get used to seeing Mark Magseo bring the pressure, bring the action every time now. Are we going to see more of the same from you? It's the same. I still I'm still hungry for winning. 
So I need to train hard every day in the gym, so to make per- to perform better. Okay. And my final two questions for you, Mark. I don't know if you're going to have an answer to this question, but do you have a favorite fighter from the UK or not? Um, in the UK, uh, Fury. Okay, Tyson Fury. Yeah. Tyson Fury. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they're, they're, he's a classy fighter, a good fighter, and big, fast in his big. Fast and big, and he's a southpaw. He's orthodox. Yeah. He's he's crazy. <laughs> yeah, crazy, crazy fighter. And just finally, Mark, if you've got any closing message, just before we end this interview, if you've got a message to send out to perhaps your supporters here in the UK, what is your closing message, my friend? To all my supporters and uh, to all my supporters and listeners now, um, please support my coming fight this coming July 9th, Saturday night. It's gonna be a great night because uh, this, this is my first defense, and yeah, it's gonna be a, a great night, a, a, a tough fight, a tough fight for me because he's a tall guy. So please support me in this coming July 9th to all Filipinos there. Absolutely, and every fight you have is very exciting. Listen, Mark, it's been a real pleasure speaking with you. Thank you for your time, and best of luck for July 9th in San Antonio, my friend. Thank you, Joey. Thank you for your time. Thank you for having me. Okay, now it's time for part two on this week's show. This part, of course, the news part of the show. And we're going to start perfectly with how we ended part one, I guess. Mikey Garcia has made the formal decision to retire from boxing. It's going to be sad to see him gone. I was a huge, huge Mikey Garcia fan. Obviously, he's on the intro every single week. Really cool guy. Really, really nice guy. And a heck of a fighter as well. Obviously, a four-weight world champion. Only lost two times uh, to Errol Spence and Sandor Martin, um, which was an upset that Sandor Martin won. The Errol Spence won. Obviously, the size and every him was, was with Spence I mean yeah what a fighter he was man but it, you know a lot of people still feel like a little bit frustrated he perhaps could have done more and achieved more but yeah to be a four weight world champion is incredible especially for a guy who a lot of people always say that same thing he he does the basics well um yeah I've, I've always kind of argued that there's a bit more to him than that um moving on to the next Part of the news, Jesse Bam Rodriguez has extended his promotional contract with Matchroom Sports, so he's going to stick with Eddie Hearn and the team for the foreseeable future. And the final piece of news that I have at the moment is that it is official between Chris Willem Smith and Isaac Chamberlain that all a British cruiserweight affair goes down July 30th in Bournemouth, the hometown of Chris Billum Smith. That's going to be a great, great fight. All the best there to Isaac Chamberlain, friend of the show. Moving on now, though, to the preview part of the show. There are two cards to mention. We're going to start here with this one. It takes place down under on Saturday. It's going to be, um, I don't think shown in the UK, but it's going to be out there on, on um, Australian TV, on Australian Main Event, I think the channel is called. But anyway, it's a weird one, actually, this card. We're going to just talk about the main event only. It is Maris Bradis, 28-1, and one, defending his IBF World Cruiserweight title. He gets in with a guy called Jai Opetai, who I'm going to be completely honest, I've never, ever heard of. And while we're here, um, I'm going to just take a little look um, at the guy, 26 years of age, um, 21 and 0, 17 KOs. He's a southpaw. Okay, that's interesting. We know that um, Maris Bridis' sole defeat was against a southpaw, being Alexander Usyk. I don't know if we can take too much from that, but um, yeah. Other than that, he went to the 2012 Olympic Games and he lost in his very first fight at the games. But yeah, other than that, I don't know too much about the guy, and I'm guessing that Maris Bridis is gonna win this one. Um, but yeah, I just don't get what he is doing. Maris Bredis has had a really weird last couple of years from calling out Jake Paul and getting a tattoo and coming to London and dressed as dressed as Super Mario. He got in the ring against um against uh, Lawrence Acoli and now he's in Australia. No one is talking about what he's doing. His 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 sole defeat is to Usyk. Absolutely no one seems to be bothered about Bradis. It's really weird. And moving out now to the final card to mention. It takes place at the Wembley Arena in London. This one's going to be live on BT Sport 
also on Saturday. Um, let's fly through this card here. Mark Chamberlain, 10-0. I think he's coming off that win last time out against Jeff Afori, if I'm not mistaken. He's a good fighter, though. He fights for the vacant IBF European lightweight title against Mark Vidal, who's 13-2 and with five draws. We've also got crowd favourite Nathan Heaney, 15-0 and in a 10-rounder against Nizar Trimetch, who's 9-3 and with two draws. That one's for the IBO international middleweight title. We've got the fight that was supposed to take place a couple of years ago and never, ever happened. It was... Uh, uh, it was supposed to be uh, Callum Johnson against Igor McCorkin. Callum Johnson, friend of the show, 20 and 1, getting in with Igor McCorkin, 24 and 3. Um, it's over 10 rounds, and it's really good that this fight hasn't escaped us because at this stage in Callum Johnson's career, he can't really afford to take a step backwards. And I think that Igor McCorkin is a really good fight for this stage of his career, but he needs to win and he needs to look quite good. The problem is, it's never easy against McCorkin. He gave Kovalev a decent fight back in 2018. That's where one of his three losses comes from. His other loss was most recently to Matthew Baldelic. That was back in September. And the loss before that was very early on. It was about 12 years ago or something, or 10, 11 years ago, something like that. But honestly, the guy's not a bad fighter. Obviously, the Russian... Um, nowadays living in Germany. The only problem is he's 37 years of age now. He is a southpaw. Um, it's going to be very, very interesting. I mean, I'm, of course, backing Callum Johnson, but like I say, he needs to win and win well because he's one of those light heavies in the UK that, you know, doesn't have the buzz at the moment that the other guys have. Even Lyndon Arthur beating Anthony Yard had a lot more buzz than Callum Johnson. Callum Johnson... You know, the one loss was to Baturbiev when he dropped Baturbiev. Why is this guy not being spoken about? I guess he's had a few issues outside of the ring with inactivity, um, you know, moving from one promoter to the next. But people have grown very frustrated and people are, you know, the, when we're talking about light heavies in the UK, people are talking about Craig Richards, Joshua Buatzi, Anthony Yard, Lyndon Arthur, I think ahead of Callum Johnson. Yeah, he's probably... Um, He's probably lost to the toughest guy out of all those guys, you know. Uh, all, all the, the other losses that the other guys have racked up, they haven't been to someone as good as Baturbiev, is what I'm trying to say. But unfortunately, he's not on the tip of the, the, the tongues of a lot of boxing fans. So he needs to win and win well, and he needs to get a shot soon enough. It was all penciled in with Joe Smith, wasn't it? And that seems to have disappeared. Now Joe Smith's not champion anymore. So, um... Yeah, he's still got a lot to do, Callum Johnson, I think, in the sport. And time is very much against him. He himself is 36. So I just said McCorkin's 37 as if he's an old dinosaur. These these guys were only a year apart. So, yeah, all the best to Callum Johnson there. Um, and I remember interviewing him about this fight about two years ago, whenever it was originally scheduled. And I actually was the guy to tell him that, yeah, this McCorkin guy is no mug, by the way. He beat Arta Baturbiev three times in the amateurs. And he went, did he? I said, yeah, he did. <laughs> so he was a good amateur, McCorkin. Like I say, beat Arta Baturbiev three times in the amateurs. And as an amateur, I think he had 200 and, 200 and something wins and only like 10 or, 10 or 15 losses. So good, good, good fighter. Um... And also on that card, Jason Cunningham, 31-6, and six, defending his IBF um, International Super Bantamweight title. I think he, I think he has the um, the belt, if I'm not mistaken. I know he had the, U I'm sure he had the European, but of course he can't defend that here. Um, yeah, he's got the IBF International Super Bantamweight title and the Commonwealth. Yeah, that's it. Um, so I'm not sure what's happened with the European. I don't know if he's vacated it or what. He probably still has it. But anyway, he gets in with former world champion Zolani Tete, 29-4. and four. Um, Tete, again, has been terribly inactive of late. I mean, honestly, the guy has probably had about five fights in the last six years or something. And they've been not that impressive. Um, I can't even think. I think he's been a world champion a couple of times, if I'm not mistaken, Tete. Maybe, maybe a, I can't remember now. It's been so hard to keep track of his career. He's disappeared back to South Africa between big wins and he's been inactive and he's been fighting random opponents in really obscure locations around the world. So, 
it's going to be a good fight, I think. But I tell you what, if Jason Cunningham beats Zelani Tete, I think I'm just going to scream because that's amazing. Cunningham is arguably the most improved fighter in Britain at the moment, and I am absolutely supporting him. And then the main event, Joe Joyce, big Joe Joyce, the juggernaut, 13-0 and in a 12-rounder against Christian Hammer, 27-9, and former victim of... Quite a few guys are now hammered, to be honest. I think he's lost two off the top of my head. Huey Fury, Tyson Fury. Um, I think he lost to Povetkin. He lost to Luis Ortiz. Um, I think I've named four there of the nine off the top of my head. I'm sure there's others that I'm forgetting at the minute. Um, but anyway, Joyce, yeah, this one's for the WBC Silver heavyweight title and the WBO International heavyweight title. I don't see the fight... Lasting too long, I think Joyce probably gets him out of there within five rounds. But yeah, that wraps up the preview part of the show. Like I said, there's only two cards that we were able to go over. Not too much going on um, this weekend, sadly. But anyway, that is it um, for the entire show. The final thing that I'm going to do is to come in with the outro, which I'm going to do in just a couple seconds. Okay, and this wraps up episode 350 of the Box Hard Podcast. I've been your host, Joey Coastman. Eddie Chambers has been with me for the duration of the show. A special thank you to our special guest, the undefeated and reigning WBC featherweight world champion, Mark Magseo. The biggest thanks of all, though, goes out to you, the listeners. Thanks once again for tuning in this week. Sorry it was such a bite-sized show, but we'll be back next week with another big episode. Until then, take care, my friends.